And let me give you a little devotion from the Word of God out of Matthew chapter 26. We'll get started there. Matthew chapter 26. We won't be long. Speaking of prayer, why don't we go to the best example there is and talk about the prayer life of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 26. You know, Jesus was a man of prayer. Let's see what we can learn from his, his prayer life so that we can apply those things to ours. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Jesus Christ is getting ready to be crucified. He knows that they're coming for him. In verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, <laughs> for their, air, their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Jesus prayed three times that night. The prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an unfathomable marvel to think that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, God manifested in the flesh, prayed. That's hard to comprehend. We know that Jesus is God. We know that the Father is God. We know that the Holy Spirit is God. And we know that these three are one but we cannot explain it. But we just believe it. Amen. That's what faith is. Some people can't, they say, I can't believe it if I can't, if you can't explain it to me, if I can't see it, then I refuse to believe it. But that's a hypocritical argument because there's a whole lot of stuff that you believe that you can't explain. I, I can't explain to you how water quenches my thirst. I don't know the science behind that. I don't know the details behind that. But just because I can't explain how that works doesn't mean that when I'm thirsty, I'm not going to drink some water. I may not be able to explain it, but why do I still do it? Because I know it works. How do I know it works? Because I tried it and experienced it. So there's things about God that are incomprehensible. In this finite mind, listen, if I could fit God in my little three, four pound brain, well, why should I worship him? But we can't fit him in there. So we'll just trust him. But it's, it's amazing. Jesus prayed. Why did he pray? Because although Jesus Christ was 100% God, at the same time, he was 100% man. And when Jesus came to this world, his main mission was to give his life on the cross of Calvary for the salvation of our souls. But he also accomplished other things. He taught us through his perfect example how to live. And if Jesus, the only perfect man that ever lived, if he needed to pray, how much more do we? Now, I'm very thankful that we have a Bible. So that we can see not only that Jesus prayed, but we can see how he did it. 
There's so many things that could be said. Let's just mention a few of it for tonight. But notice that when he prayed, he said, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. I see two things here. I see honesty. When you pray, be honest with God. Amen. That's the wonderful thing about praying alone. Now, tonight we prayed corporately as a church. We need to do that. But you also need to pray in your own time. And when you do that, that'll be the best time for you to really get honest with the Lord and talk to him about some things that you more than likely probably wouldn't talk with other people about. But the good thing about talking to God about it is you don't have to worry about him repeating it. Somebody said here recently, man, be careful what you say about brother, around Brother Manny because before you know it, it'll become an illustration. <laughs> Well, you don't have to worry about that with Jesus. You can talk to him in confidence. You can trust him. He's trustworthy. But not only do we see honesty. Listen, be honest with, with God. He knows anyways. Why, why would we lie to God? What are you going to accomplish? That, what a big waste of time. Tell him what's on your heart. Something's bothering you. Somebody's bothering you. Talk to him about it. Man, that sister in the church, man, she really gets on my nerves. <laughs> well, maybe if you talk to God about her, maybe she wouldn't get on your nerves so much after a while. Because as you pray, you might start developing a burden for her. That's how prayer works. It'll adjust your attitude. It'll adjust your mentality, your perspective on things. I see honesty in his prayer life. I see, but I also see obedience. That's the key to successful prayer. Lord, here's what I want. Here's what I desire. Here's what I prefer. And sometimes God will give you what you want. Sometimes he does. I appreciate Brother Charlie mentioning in prayer tonight. We're praying for a house. Well, we need a house. We got to live somewhere. We're, we're here by the church, but it sure would be nice to have a place that we can call our own. Wouldn't that be nice? Nothing wrong with being honest with the Lord. Lord, we sure would like to have a place we could call uh, our own. You never can tell. God just may answer your prayer. And maybe the reason God's not answering your prayers is because you're just not asking. Asking ye shall receive. But now sometimes he won't answer it the way that you think or the way that you would like for him to do so. Just trust in those occasions that God is always right. He knows what's best all the time. It just may be that in your prayer request, you have one desire, but God may be planning something way better. You remember the example of, of uh, when Lazarus was sick and Mary and Martha sent a servant to advise the Lord, uh, please come and heal Lazarus. He's sick. This is your friend that you love. He's very sick. And we know that you're a great physician. We've seen you heal others. We've heard the stories. And, 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 and so, so please come and help us. But Jesus didn't go when they expected him to show up. He showed up a couple days later. And before you know it, Lazarus, the situation got worse and then he died. You ever been in that situation before? Lord, I'm doing the right thing. I'm praying. And it seems like the situation just keeps getting worse. But you know the rest of the story. Eventually, Jesus did something even greater than what they asked for. They asked for healing. Jesus was planning something even greater. He said, I'm going to raise him from the dead. So be patient. Sometimes the answer of the Lord is yes. Sometimes the answer of the Lord is no. And sometimes the answer from the Lord is wait. But every time he'll be right every time. And his way will be best. So we see that Jesus prayed with an obedient attitude. That's the key to effective prayer. Lord, this is my desire. Here's my petition. But at the end of the day, whatever you want to do, however you want to deal with it, I submit to that. If you'll pray like that, you'll see success in your prayer life. 
It's how Jesus prayed. You know how Jesus prayed? Intentionally. His prayer life was intentional. Look at Luke chapter 9, very quickly. Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter number 9, verse 28, And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into, went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, and the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. Jesus had a custom of going off into a mountain to pray. I'll never forget in Puerto Rico, they have a, where we lived, we lived in the tallest parts of the mountains in, in Hialeah, Puerto Rico. And there's a section where you can go to the tippy top. They call it La Puntita. And you go up there and uh, it's a very scary drive. It's like this. Any of y'all ever go with me when y'all came and visited us? It's way up there. And from that point of the mountain, you can see all the way around the island. It's not a very big island. It's about 100, it's 120 miles long from east to west and about 40 miles from north to south. Now that's, you know, you could, from, that, from the tip of the mountain or from the top of the mountain, you can see all, all points, north, south, east, and west on a clear day. And we'd go up there and we would pray for God to save souls and We'd sing songs. Hasmin and Clarissa would bring their instruments at time and we'd just worship the Lord up there. We'd bring visiting preachers and missionaries that would come by to preach for us and we'd take them up there and, and, uh, and pray. Brother Joe Martinez, the missionary we support to Cuba, he came to preach a revival for us. I took him up there to pray and, and he got all stirred up. He got to preaching. I said, Joe, you crazy? There ain't nobody up here but us. He goes, no, no, but Brother Manny, your voice can carry through the mountains. I said, man, you're nuts. <laughs> I just let him be. He just got to preaching like a, like a crazy man. He said, I guarantee you them towns in the valleys, they're going to hear it. It's going to travel down the mountain. I said, all right, knock yourself out. But Jesus had a habit of, of, of getting away from the people. And that's the point here, my brethren. Uh, you need to pray intentionally. You need to find a place where you can go. You know, the old timers talked about the prayer closet. It don't necessarily have to be in the closet. Your closet might not be big enough. But the idea is to find a place of solitude where you can get alone with you and God and you can just talk about some things. Sometimes my wife need to, and, and I, we just need to talk about some things. And Junior or Mia will barge into the room and We'll have to tell, hey, you guys are going to have to step out for a minute. We're trying to talk about grown-up stuff right now. And that's what you need to do with the Lord. You need a time where you can get alone with you and God, a solitary time where you can just concentrate on the things of God and be honest with God and be open with God and pour out your heart before God. Uh, look at Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1. Just some things about the way the Lord prayed that we could follow his example. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed, notice, into a solitary place. And there prayed. Now, if you look in the verses before that, you find that many were coming to the Lord. So that he could minister to them, so that he could cast out devils and, and heal people. The Lord was tending to everybody else. But the Lord taught the disciples, here I am tending to everyone else, but I must set aside time where I can just tend to myself and the Lord and my relationship with him. The Heavenly Father. And it's so important that you do that because uh, us as preachers, we can get so busy uh, ministering to everybody else as we ought to do that we forget to spend time just between myself and God. 
And the same with you. In your busy schedule, in your busy life, you've got your 40, 50, 60 hour uh, a week job and you've got your responsibilities to your children and to your grandchildren and to your wife and your husband and your loved ones and, and all the different responsibilities and the daily routine. You can get so caught up in, in these good and necessary things, not things that are necessarily bad, but you can get so busy that you forget to set aside the time that you need to talk to God. If you're too busy to pray, you are too busy. I was just thinking today about some things I need to cut out of my life so that I can have more time for the ministry and for the things of the Lord. Every so often you need to do a little spiritual inventory in your life. What, what are some things that I can do without? So that I can have more time to concentrate on reading my Bible or more time to pray or more time for my children or more time to witness or more time so that I can show up to church. <laughs> so the Lord set aside time. Hey, listen, if you find yourself having a hard time praying, sing some songs, just some, some tips. Sing a hymn or two. You know how it is sometimes you, you know that you need to pray. You've set aside the time to pray. That's good. But then you set that time aside and sometimes you'll find yourself having a hard time getting started. Maybe because you're weighed down with all the burdens of the day and, and all this. You might be a little bit tired mentally, physically drained. You know what to help you? Now, it's going to require discipline uh, just as much as. But if you'll start singing some songs, it'll put you in a mood to pray. Don't worry if you don't sing very well. It's just you and God anyways. And he's very forgiving. <laughs> just sing a couple songs. And before you know it, you'll, you'll find the Holy Spirit lifting your spirit up. And you'll get to a point where you'll be able to talk to God. You know, another good tip uh, for praying. Write your prayers down. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the old time Christians... Uh, that was their custom. They would have a prayer journal and they would write their prayers. Prayers for humility. Prayers for holiness. Prayers for uh, sanctification. Uh, intercessory prayers, for, uh, pray, which is prayers for others. Uh, prayers for whatever the case may be. If you're struggling with a certain thing, pray about that thing and write a prayer out. Uh, write a little prayer out when it comes time to read the Bible. It don't have to be a big old long prayer. It don't have to be a two, three hour prayer. But write down a few lines that you can pray. Oh God, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things in thy law. In Jesus' name, amen. Write your prayers down. Uh, another thing about prayer, Luke 22. Luke 22. We're moving on. We're moving on. Look at Luke 22. Luke 22 verses uh, the same story. But a couple more details added here. Luke 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. See, see the Lord's custom there? He made sure that he was away from the crowd, even away from his own disciples that he loved at times. He needed to get alone with the Heavenly Father. And kneeled down and prayed, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. Never, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. I love that verse of scripture. I believe it. I believe that when you get on your knees and talk to God, that if you're really praying in the Holy Ghost, like the Bible talks about, it says pray in the Holy Ghost, does it not? Well, I would assume that that's a little bit different than some of the prayers that we pray before we eat. This uh, missionary brother down in Mexico, he, he was a new missionary and he was just learning Spanish. And uh, he was in the service and the, and the pastor asked, calling him to pray in a Spanish-speaking church. He, didn't know, he hardly knew any Spanish. And so he just got nervous and he goes, Oh, Dios. Adios. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I would imagine praying in the Holy Ghost involves a little more than that. But notice that the Lord got on his knees 
before the heavenly father. He's preparing himself, brethren, to be, he's getting ready to be crucified. He knows that his enemies are on the way to arrest them like a criminal. Persecution is going to come, Lord, my brethren. Hard times will come. Trials, tribulations. We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, says the word of God. And you're never going to make it if you don't develop the habit of getting on your knees. Instead of getting on social media to complain about it to everybody else, get on your knees uh, in a solid place of solitude and complain about it to God. And as you talk to God, hey, you never can tell, God just may send an angel in heaven to visit you. I believe the Bible. I believe when we give an invitation, we give an altar call, that people that come forward to pray, I believe God will send an angel from heaven to wrap his arms around that individual and whisper in his or her ear, don't worry, everything's going to be all right. I really believe that. You need, listen, you, you need strength to move on. You need strength to get through that trial. You need strength to soldier through. Listen, learn to get on your face before God and talk to God about it. The Bible says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Notice, not to faint. The reason why we've got so many Christians that are getting knocked out of the race, knocked out of church. They're not in their Bibles anymore. They don't witness to nobody anymore. They have no strength anymore. They're fainting spiritually. You know why? Because they quit praying. Prayer is the key that unlocks the power of God in your life. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5, just a little devotion on prayer. Hebrews chapter 5. Oh, brethren, if we, could, if we could pray like we should, I believe we'll see God work. I believe we'll see sinners saved. I believe we, we'll see homes repaired. I believe we'll see God working in the lives of our children and our grandchildren like never before. Look at Hebrews chapter number five, verse number seven. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, notice, with strong crying. Listen, I, I appreciate, I'm a fan of, of, of what they call it, uh, toxic masculinity. I'm a fan of it. They say that it's a bad thing nowadays. Until war breaks out. <laughs> but listen, when you're getting alone with you and God, that's not the time for toxic masculinity. That's time to be even better and stronger, to be a godly man. Amen. To be honest with God. You don't, need to be, you don't need to be macho camacho when you're talking to God. That's your heavenly father. Now, when you're dealing with the enemy on the battlefield, okay, be an Abishai, be a David. But when you're dealing with the Heavenly Father, be humble. Amen. Be honest with the Lord. Pour out your heart before God. Notice, Jesus Christ himself. I mean, if there was ever a man, behold the man. Who was a greater man than Jesus Christ? He stared the devil in, his, in the face and said, it is finished. <laughs> and brought salvation to the world. And yet the Bible says, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, notice, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard, and that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus prayed with intensity. Look at Luke 20, 22. We're almost done. Luke 22. He prayed with intensity. Luke 22, verse 41, again. Well, look at verse uh, 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. We need to pray more earnestly. Amen. And his sweat were 
was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Well, that's some pretty intense praying. Now, I don't expect every prayer to be like that. You know, at the dinner table, all of a sudden, you start sweating drops of blood <laughs> over the pork chops. But there is a time to agonize in prayer. Some of you have got some heavy burdens. Some of you have some brokenness in your heart over maybe your children, maybe your grandchildren, maybe your wife, maybe your husband, maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's a situation on the job, maybe it's a situation at the church. We've all got some burdens. I've got some burdens. Please pray for me. And that's, you know, that's just a Christian life. That's the way, it's going to be that way till Jesus comes, my brother. And so we need to, to, to set our pride aside, set that, that pride aside, and learn to get on your face before God and agonize in prayer. When are you doing that? Uh, look at Luke 22. Last thing. And then we'll go to John 17 and then we're done. Uh, we're, still, we're there in Luke 22. Look at verse 31. You know how Jesus prayed? The prayer life of Jesus was intentional. It was invigorating. It was intense. It was intercessory. What does that mean? He prayed for others. He prayed for others. Nothing wrong with praying for your needs, but don't forget everybody else. We need you to pray for us. You need us to pray for you. And in Luke 20, uh, 22, look at verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Pray for your brethren. We've got the same enemy. If the devil had his way, he'd wipe us all out. We need to pray one for another. Listen, uh, Peter was somebody that always was constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. <laughs> Can you imagine how much he must, have, he must have annoyed the other disciples, all the crazy things he would say? The Lord was constantly rebuking him. And out of all the disciples, the, there weren't any other disciples the Lord rebuked more from what we see in the scriptures than Simon. I've had people ask me, uh, Brother Manny, why do you put up with them people? Well, because the Lord puts up with me and you. The Lord put up with Peter. You know the story. Peter messed up so many times. Denied the Lord three times. But you know what? Jesus didn't give up on him. Listen, Jesus won't give up on you no matter how many times you mess up. Seven weeks later, you know where you find Simon Peter? On the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaching Jesus Christ, and 3,000 souls getting saved and baptized and added to the church. That's why Jesus didn't give up on him. Don't give up on your brethren. Amen. We mentioned prayer for some folks, even tonight, that have been out of the way for a while. Don't give up on them. Amen. The Lord didn't give up on you. But notice, Jesus prayed. Look, look at verse 32. Look at what Jesus said about Simon Peter. But I have prayed for thee. He says, the devil's going to get you. There are some Christians that you and I know, the devil is, is taking advantage of them. We need to pray for them. Jesus said, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Look at John 17. That's the last place and we're done. Intercessory prayer. John 17 and we're done. And when you get a chance, read that whole chapter in your own time. This is the Lord's prayer for his disciples. And if you'll read that chapter, it'll teach you how to pray for your brethren. How wonderful to have an example from the Lord. Of how he prayed. Here's his prayer. We don't have time to read it all. But we'll skip through a few things. Look at verse 9. John 17 verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou has given me. For they are thine. Intercessory prayer. Look at verse 10. And, and all, are mine, all, all mine are thine. And thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. You know what you need to pray? Uh, how you need to pray for your brethren? Pray that the Lord would be glorified through your brethren. When you pray for, for Brother Esai, pray that the Lord would be glorified in his life. 
When you pray for Hunter Van Dam, pray that God would be glorified in his life and, and in the life of his family. When you pray for one another, pray for the Lord to be glorified through them. The problem is when you're a selfish Christian and you want all the glory for yourself, you're not going to pray like that. We've got too much selfish Christianity. There's no room for ego in this, brethren. This is not a competition. And by the way, I, I wanted to say this last Sunday night, and I forgot to say it, but my goal as the new pastor of Calvary Baptist Church is not to outdo Brother Baker. Amen. Just so you know. <laughs> is that okay? Amen. I praise the Lord for, what that, for how the Lord worked in that man's life and through his life for 45 years. But now that I'm here, I'm just going to focus on what God wants to do going forward. Amen. All right. Here's my point. This is not a competition. Amen. I, I hated that. I hated that on the mission field. I'd see missionaries. It was as if they were in competition one with another. That's disgusting. Right. You ought to love your brethren. Mm -hmm. If you see God using your brother in a mighty way, man, you ought to be thankful for that. Pray for your brethren. Pray for your brothers and sisters. So many times I've seen women at each other like cats in the church. God can't be glorified when things like that are going on. It's not a competition, brethren. You focus on what God would have you to do and you do it to the best of your ability for the honor and the glory of God. Amen. All right. I, re I realized that that was kind of tough. We'll move on. Verse 11, and I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep, thou, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Like Brother Scaletti prayed tonight. Pray for the unity of your brethren. Amen. That goes back to what I just got done saying. You know, one thing you need to mention in your, prayer, that, in your prayers, that we can work one with another. I've worked in churches where I had people that would do the opposite on purpose just to be stubborn. Don't be like that. That's a bad heart. I had a man in the church one time. I, I knew he would oppose me no matter what I said. So I on purpose told him when I had a job for him to do the opposite of what I wanted so that when he opposed me, he would end up really agreeing with what I really wanted him to do. And it worked. <laughs> Don't be like that, brethren. Let's work with each other, brethren. Amen. All right? Unity. Pray for the unity of your brethren. Look at verse 13. I'm, I'm rushing. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You ought to pray for the joy of your brethren. Amen. Listen. If you're the kind of person that you like to see others miserable and hurting, you are a wicked, wicked, wicked individual. You ought to want your brethren to be happy in the Lord, just as happy in the Lord as you, as you are, as you, as you want to be. If you see a brother or sister that's struggling, you ought to pray for that individual instead of kick him or her while they're down. See there, I told you, they're getting what they deserve. Maybe they are getting what they deserve. We, we reap what we sow. But listen, when I see God whooping up on somebody, why do I need to step in and add an extra blow? Really? No, our job is to pray one for another. Amen. Trust me, God knows how to humble every one of us. And when I see God working over a brother or sister in Christ, chastening him or her, hey, let God do his thing. And you do what you ought to do. Be a brother or sister. That doesn't mean justify sin. We're not going to justify sin. But listen, there's a time to rebuke and there's a time to restore. Amen. Ah, I'll preach in another night. <laughs> Verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Notice, keep them from the evil. Pray for your brethren to persist and to persevere through this present and evil world. This world is full of temptation. Please pray for me. Boy, preachers have a target on their back, a special target. It seems like when preachers fall, they fall into the craziest stuff. 
But I tell you what it is, because when you when you serve God, you put a special target on your back. You know why? Because my what a trophy. Now, if you're not doing anything for the Lord, don't worry about it. The devil is not worried about you. But if you intend to serve God, the devil is going to come after you. We need to pray for one another. Pray for your brethren that they can, that they would have the strength that they need to resist temptation and to overcome evil and have the same type of victory that you desire in your life. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 29. We're, we're, we're almost, I said 29, not 19. 19, verse 19. Verse 19 of John 17. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Pray for the sanctification of your brethren. You know what sanctification is? It's, it's, it's purity. Cleansing. Pray for your brethren that they would walk right. That they would talk right. That they would look right. That they would act right. It's one thing to criticize them when they don't talk right and walk right and look right and do right. But are you praying for the brethren that they would do right? Pray for your brethren. Pray for their sanctification. And then lastly of all, well no, not lastly, look at verse, uh, look at verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Pray that the love of God would remain in your brethren. Pray that your brothers and sisters in Christ would operate by the love of God. If we do what we do simply because we just love God, why do you go to church? Because I love Jesus. Why do you read the Bible? Because I love him so much, I just, I, I want to learn more about him. Why do you show up to the evangelism on Saturday? Because I love God so much, I want everybody else to know about it. Why do you hold up signs? Why do you play the piano? Why do you clean the church? Why do you mow the lawn? We just love Jesus. Amen. Pray that the brethren would do what they do simply because they're motivated by the love of God. Because if we're motivated by the love of God, there's no limit to what God could accomplish through us. Let's all stand for, for a word of prayer. Final word of prayer. All right, brethren. Thank you for your faithfulness. We'll close in a word of prayer and you'll be dismissed. All right? Brother Kenny, pray for us, please. Lord, again, we thank you for this time together, Lord, to pray. Keep our hearts on things, the needs of others, Lord, except for just the needs of ourselves. We pray, Lord, that we look in your scriptures, we see the example of prayer. And Lord, sometimes, a lot of times, our prayer life is messed up. Lord. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, to be able to talk to you and say the right things, Lord, and yes. so that you can minister to us. Lord. We just thank you for that. Bless the rest of our week, Lord, keep us safe from this world. We just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. Hey, Mr. Manny, you think we sing a hymn more? A song at the hymnal real quick. Okay. What song you want to sing? 236. Y'all want to sing a song? Sure. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right. 236. <coughs> Just because we like Andrew so much. Is it a song that we know? Because if Maybe not... Grace. Even I know. Okay. <coughs> all right. 236.
Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.